By the time the DePaul Wabash rivalry entered the second half of the 20th century, 1950 had already been a newsmaking year. President Truman signed off on both construction of the hydrogen bomb and the start of the Korean War. The first ever organ transplant was done that year, it involved a kidney, and the post-war baby boom began. At DePauw, a cornerstone was laid for the planned Memorial Student Union Building, and President Clyde Wildman announced it would be his final year. They rallied in the streets of Greencastle before the game, and Tiger fans had much to cheer about early. Ward Shawver gained 35 yards on this end run. And on the next play, Gene Gephardt threw a 28-yard scoring pass to Jim Hollensteiner. Wabash's Ted Stieg barrels in here, but the extra point was no good, so it's 7-6 DePaul. The Tigers build a bigger lead after Steve Nagy takes the pitch, and check out this classic Monon moment. A train is rolling by as he fights his way into the end zone. Then it's Gephardt again to a wide open Hollensteiner from 33 yards out. As the teams head to the locker room at halftime, the scoreboard reads 20 to six visitors. But the Tiger Band wasn't the only unit planning a march. Early in the second half, Gephardt under duress is picked off. Wabash coach Glenn Harmison said that after this play, we just caught fire. Stieg takes a pitch out and runs in from 23 yards out. Ken Beasley blocks a punt. Shortly afterward, Mike Gillis goes around the right end. It's an 11-yard touchdown run, and now the game is tied. A DePaul quick kick and another block. The return takes it to the six-yard line, and the Little Giants score on the next play. And then Bill Orman seals the deal. He grabs an errant pass and cradles it for 62 yards. Wabash winds up 4-2-3 and three on the season and keeps the bell a second straight year. For DePaul, it's a 4-4 four and four campaign and one that got away. It was the buzz at DePauw's hub and on campus radio station WGRE. Even the university's new president, Russell Humbert, was smiling about the Tiger football team that packed a bite. DePauw entered the season's final game with a spotless 7-0 record. Wabash had six wins, no losses, and one tie. So for the first time in the series history, the two teams would enter the battle for the Monon Bell with undefeated records. But put aside the notion of a tough back and forth struggle, if you were to look up domination in the dictionary, the definition might be accompanied by this, the only surviving image from the 1951 game. Led by Stan Huntsman's 143 yards on 14 carries and brother Jerry Huntsman's four touchdown passes, Wabash piled up 565 yards of offense. DePaul quarterback Bob Stevens spent much of the day on his back. He was sacked for losses totaling 86 yards. Overall, the Tigers ended the day with negative 17 yards in 41 rushing attempts. In a romp, Wabash finished its first undefeated season since 1915. DePaul inaugurated its 15th president, Russell Humbert, in October of 1952, with the Old Gold football game versus Georgetown afterward. The hanky-panky on campus that fall extended beyond this. The Monon Bell was briefly stolen from Wabash about a week before the game and then returned. It was noted as the second ever Bell heist, the first coming in 1941. The Tigers entered the big game with a four and three record, a newspaper preview said spirits were high, but the game plan was stop Stan. That'd be Huntsman, the Wabash halfback who burned DePaul the year before and who had carried the ball on half to three quarters of the Little Giants' plays this season. Wabash's paper boiled it down to a different two words, beat DePaul. Having held the bell for three years, the men in red paraded it before the crowd on game day. 
Tiger Faithful also made a grand entrance without a prize, these game day photos capture what it was like in Crawfordsville. Huntsman scored an early touchdown, and with his team already up 19-0, the running back took a handoff, dropped back, and hit Tom Hankinson with a 25-yard scoring pass. It was 40-zip and not yet halftime after this pick six by John Stoner. This big-time sack by the Little Giant defense symbolized the tough day the Tiger offense endured. As feared, Huntsman was a hoss, leading a ground game that totaled 281 yards with more than 500 yards of total offense. They paraded the bell again after the final gun sounded on a 47-0 Wabash blowout. From Here to Eternity, released in August of 1953, went on to win the Oscar for Best Picture for that year. For DePaul football fans, it had seemed like an eternity. For four straight campaigns, the Monon Bell had been ringing in Crawfordsville. Before the 53 game, the DePaul marching band seemed to taunt Wabash fans as they paraded past the visitors' stands with a dog in tow. That hound later got on the field and held things up, but there was no stopping the letter H, which had dominated DePauw for two straight bell battles. Huntsman, first name Stan, was again a force to be reckoned with in his senior year Monon Bell Classic. On this day, he collected 194 yards rushing on 20 carries, 28 on this scamper, and was a key factor as his team built an early lead, while the Tigers, winless all season long, struggled mightily. Huntsman was on the final receiving end of a pair of pitches that led to this touchdown. And quarterback Valno Graham found him wide open on a scoring connection through the air. Wabash had 443 yards of offense. DePaul only managed 120, all but one on the ground. Drafted by the NFL's Chicago Cardinals, Stan Huntsman instead became a legendary college track coach. He was in charge of the 1968 men's U.S. Olympic track team and worked with 52 NCAA champions. He's a member of the National Track and Field Hall of Fame. It was a gorgeous day for the 61st edition of this rivalry game, but in 1954, things were gray in the world of DePauw football. The Tigers came in with no wins, six losses, and one tie. The team they hadn't beaten since 1948, Wabash, was having a good year with a 6-1-1 one one mark. It was already 7-0 Wabash early when DePauw tackled Tom Holthouse, recovered a fumble at the Little Giant 26. But Coach Mike Snavely's offense sputtered, and the guys in red were re-energized. Their running game, fueled by power and trickery, bowled over the visitors' defense. A second quarter interception by DePaul's Art Bryant at the goal line temporarily kept Wabash from building on its lead. But that didn't last. Freshman fullback Bill Gabbert scored a touchdown. The cameraman only caught the tail end of it and the extra point. On the subsequent kickoff, Johnny Rickoff gave Tiger fans a thrill. He rambled 49 yards to the Wabash 26. But the drive that followed produced no follow-up, and Wabash went to the locker room with a 14-0 halftime advantage. As the crowd enjoyed a performance by the DePaul marching band, the Little Giants and Coach Garland Frazier were in their locker room determined to finish the job they had started. It wasn't very deep into the second half when fleet back Don Cayley scored, and the Wabash offense continued to pound away. The home team's advantage grew to 28 zip. Late with the field covered in afternoon shadows, freshman quarterback Maury Goodnight tried in vain to get DePaul in the end zone. 
But when time expired, it was another Monon shutout, DePaul's second consecutive winless season, and a sixth straight Little Giant Bell victory. The 1955 game day program had DePaul in a blue jersey, but that was about the only thing wrong with a contest that went down as a Monon Bell to remember. Photos show the tough fight that was waged on the Blackstock Stadium turf that November day. Wabash had held the prized trophy for six years running, and film footage shows a little giant squad that was determined to keep hold of the bell. It was a back and forth battle throughout, tied 13-13 at halftime, and then was 20 all late in the game. With time winding down and a fourth and two situation for DePaul, Maury Goodnight fakes the punt and finds Dick Hackenberg with a pass that puts the ball at Wabash's 37 yard line. A few plays later, Goodnight connects with Gene Halliday and the ball is on the 10. Fast forward a few more moments with two seconds left on the clock, Freddie Williams, a fullback, was called upon to attempt his first career field goal. Here's the actual call from DePaul's student radio station, WGRE. There's a pass back, the boot is up. It's, it's good! It's good, it's good, it's good, fans! It's good, it's good, it's good! And that ends the game, and DePaul wins! Yes, fans, we did it! Freddie Williams won that ball game for us. With that field going, we won the ball game. The final score, fans, 23 for DePaul and 20 for Wabash. Nineteen fifty-six is remembered as the year Dick Clark became the host of American Bandstand. DePaul had a new, well-dressed man on its sidelines. Bob Hicks was the Tigers' new head football coach. Although basking in the afterglow of the previous year's heroics by Fred Williams, the men in black and gold were one and six heading into the big game. Wabash was six and two. They had each lost to their only common opponent, Butler. It was just five weeks after Don Larson pitched a perfect game in the World Series. Twelve days later, DePaul dedicated its new Roy O. West Library. Elvis Presley's Love Me Tender was number one across the nation as the two teams took the field in Crawfordsville in their annual rivalry game. And this one was a scrappy back and forth contest. An early Wabash drive was short-circuited by this Tiger interception. But it was the Little Giants getting on the scoreboard first. This run set up the home team for that score. It was a one-yard touchdown plunge by Bill Gabbert, capping a 55-yard drive. Wabash took a 7-0 lead into the locker room at halftime. The second stanza began with a 10-play, 60-yard drive by DePaul, but film of the two-yard touchdown run by Skip Matheson has not survived. It ended 7-7, the first tie in the series that wasn't scoreless, and DePaul held on to the Monon Bell. The spring of 1957 brought Vice President Richard Nixon to the DePaul campus to receive an honorary doctorate and speak at Business and Industry Day. When it came to the important business of the fall, and more important than this, the gang in Greencastle hoped to hang on to the Monon Bell for a third straight year. On game day, fans of Wabash formed a human chain as the Little Giants took the field. DePaul backers did the same for their guys and the mascot rode in in style. A closer look reveals a sign that seems to say, Wabash, we're on your donkey. With this creative shot lining up the trophy and the action, the visitors took an early lead. The cameraman rolled late on a 70-yard pass from George Trout to Joe Chester, almost a touchdown. It set up this TD plunge by Trout. But it was all to paw from there forward, Quarterback Maury Goodnight, the nation's leading small college passer, had a field day. He hits Dick Hackenberg on this 21-yard pass to tie the game. Goodnight and Hackenberg also connected on this one-yard scoring pass. And this is one of Goodnight's three TD runs on the day. 
DePaul's defense was stingy, shutting Wabash out for the game's final 52 minutes. The only downside, the Tigers missed five of their six extra point tries on the day. The Indianapolis Star headline said it all, as Wabash's lead in the all-time series was reduced to five in a rump. Nineteen fifty eight was marked by Elvis Presley's induction into the Army and the introduction of the hula hoop. Twenty five million of them were sold in the first four months for a dollar ninety eight each. At DePauw, new faculty members posed outside the recently constructed Memorial Student Union building, which featured the hub where students could dine, gather for snacks and pose for photos. October brought the dedication of a new art center in what was previously the Carnegie Library and poet Carl Sandburg visited campus. A month later, when this thing was on the line, DePaul entered the big game one and seven on the season. Wabash was three and five. It was Garland Frazier's first losing season in eight campaigns. Before the rivalry game, DePaul coach Bob Hicks said, we're every bit as good as they are, if not better, but predicted a quote, nip and tuck affair. The field in Crawfordsville was described as muddy and sawdust covered. It didn't take long for the Tigers to tour it. The visitors' opening drive covered 11 plays and 67 yards and was capped by this two-yard touchdown run by Butch Colon. On the next series, DePaul sophomore quarterback John Rubish dials long distance. Perry Gillette is on the receiving end. The camera stops before he reaches the goal line, but he did. A second successful two-point conversion makes it 16-zip. This game's big star was senior George Matusis. The fullback carried the ball 29 times for 132 yards, and this three-yard touchdown plunge in the second half sealed the deal. Smeared is the word DePaul's student newspaper used to describe the outcome. If you have all those ministers out there, I'm sure that we go up against Butler and, and Wabash in those schools. We're going to need a lot of praying, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> DePaul began the 1959 football season with a new coach who brought a colorful resume and a wisecracking personality. Tom Mont, who starred in college at Maryland, played for the Washington Redskins, and then was head coach at Maryland, was now prowling the Tiger sidelines. Before the season's final game with Wabash, DePaul was 1-7. The men in scarlet were three and five. The cover of the game day program suggested an old fashioned scrap, and this one played in bitter cold conditions was a battle in the trenches all day long. In the second quarter, Joe Sabatini of Wabash crosses the goal line before losing the football. It makes it 6-0 for the visitors, but the try for two comes up empty. In the third quarter, Dick Mace, who carried the ball 30 times for 125 yards, gets the Tigers rolling on this run. Three snaps later, a running play that started on the left side of the field winds up going the other way, a 13-yard touchdown run to the right corner of the end zone. The film doesn't show it, but this kick was no good. It's 6-6, and it sets up a thrilling finish. Wabash is at the DePauw 16 with about a minute left when Sabatini takes a pitch out and gallops to the four-yard line. The Little Giants have four downs and about 50 seconds to take it in. A first down run yields just about a yard. Second down brings another run. This one winds up at about the two yard line. Jim Hampshire runs it on third down. He is stopped at the Tiger one. So now it's fourth and goal, about 15 seconds left. Hampshire takes it, but runs into a pile of black jerseys. He is denied and Wabash dejectedly shuffles off the turf. Bob Collins of the Indianapolis Star called it a first-class football game, adding, next year's contest should be a Lulu.